Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this um, talk by Michael on uh, secure programming, basically. Uh, let me just briefly introduce myself. My name is Martin. I'm a front-end developer at CodeStar. CodeStar is a business unit of Ordina. And we, uh, we work with real-time streams, with functional reactive programming in back-end and front-end. And of course, as in any programming language and any platform, you need to do that securely. And uh, I met you one time at a client that I was working, ING. You were giving secure programming trainings there. And I was uh, on the edge of my seat for the eight hours that the workshop, uh, workshop ran. So it was actually one of the best workshops I was in. And that's why I asked you to come here. And uh, you've consulted all over the world uh, yes. for different companies. And uh, you know, we're happy to have you here and see uh, what you can tell us. And just briefly, the program. Uh, we're going to have, after the one hour talk, a uh, small break so you can get something to drink, have a chat. Uh, we, have some, we have an arcade that you can play with, some uh, a lockpick set at the entrance if you want to play with that. Don't steal it, please. It's my only one. And uh, then the second talk. And after that, again, drinks. And of course, if you have any questions, we'll give you some uh, opportunity to ask them after the talks. Uh, if you have any more questions, yeah. just uh, go to one of my colleagues that you can recognize with this snazzy polo shirt. And uh, yeah, that's it. Enjoy, everyone. Uh, and give it up for Michael. Thank you very much. So thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm very pleased to be here. And thank you very much to Ordina and CodeStar for having me here in the first place. It's a lovely building, quite a lovely Christmas tree, so it's very festive here. Um, maybe if they move the building closer to Eindhoven one day, I will join the company. But I don't think they're going to relocate the whole place. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Well, that <laughs> indeed. So I've been doing this job for quite some time. I've been over 11 years now doing uh, web app pen testing mostly. I also do quite a lot of code reviews, um, network architecture, design review, that kind of thing. Um, so just the general web security, application security stuff. Um, as uh, Martin mentioned, I've presented before at clients. It's usually like a six to eight hour course. I've tried to condense a lot of that. I've cut out bits, made it a bit more free flowing. If I'm, I'm used to a very interruptive, uh, interactive format. So I guess if at any point people have questions, I'm fine with anybody just raising a hand and shouting. That's cool. Um, otherwise, just pay, pay attention, I guess. And uh, Thanks, all, thanks again for coming, even though it's really cold out. Um, that's also, hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll bask in the warm afterglow of learning something. And if you don't learn, it, learn anything, then maybe all my talking and hot air will warm the room up enough that, you know, everybody will be nice and warm. So, um, and basically, the point of today is just, it's a security crash course, basically. So I'm going to introduce some of the processes and tools that we use when doing web application testing. I'm going to provide an overview of some common vulnerabilities that you may have run into if you've had security uh, investigations done on some of the applications you've written. And I'm going to show you how to find and exploit some of these vulnerabilities. I'll try to do an interactive demo at the end of the session. We'll see how that goes, because it usually doesn't work in demo. Demo gods are not happy. so. Um, the main resource that I'm going to recommend is OWASP.org. OWASP is a really good resource online for learning all about security in general, both web app specific, code review, all kinds of things like that. So feel free to go to OWASP.org, read about the OWASP top 10, which you've probably heard of, um, and follow the OWASP testing guide, which is also a really good methodology for learning how to test. A good way to start testing is also to download Kali Linux. You can just get a virtual machine running on your laptop. It contains a whole lot of tools. They're all there. Uh, the red ones are the ones that I would normally use during web app tests. Um, you can use a few more, uh, but these are roughly the ones I'm going to cover, not, not too in, deep, in depth, but I'm going to mention them. So overall, why is security important? And who thinks security is a high priority? Well, overall, 89% of medium-sized business senior management think that security is important. And 91% of large business uh, senior management think it's important. So really, if you want you know, to develop your career and also look appealing to these managers, then potentially having something with a, hey, I know security on your resume would be really nice. Um, and over 50% of senior management in finance, insurance, health, and social case sectors uh, think it's very high priority. So. There's quite a lot of pressure for this lately. Of course, you've seen a lot of stuff in the news about hacks, um, breaches, and things like that. I'll try to call out some examples of recent uh, instances of the various ones lately uh, as we go. So 
one of the questions I normally ask people is, how often do you think uh, servers exposed on the internet are hacked? And actually, internally at the company, um, over 10 years ago, in 2005, there was a guy, uh, Walter Bulgers, who actually ran a honeypot system, meaning uh, he had a computer connected to the internet, which was just on a publicly reachable IP. He had a port exposed, so people could just connect to it. And he tracked how often people would connect. And back in 2005, it was roughly one every minute. Since then, it has increased quite a bit. So Kaspersky ran something similar, and over six months, um, they had 12 million attacks, which evens out to about three attempts every four seconds. So if we just round that up, one every second, that's quite a lot. Um, so if you have a computer at home, maybe, you've just bought a new computer, you've connected it directly to your internet, you've not configured anything, and somehow it's directly exposed to the internet, maybe it's a Windows box, that'll probably take at least three hours or so to patch, that's a lot of hack attempts, one per second for three hours if it's directly reachable online. So it's actually quite likely that you're getting scanned constantly, whether it's by specific malicious people or search engines like Shodan or something like that, which just constantly scan the internet for exposed uh, devices, webcams, things like that. Um, you will get scanned, you will potentially have somebody trying to connect to you, and depending on what operating system you're using, like Windows or something more insecure or that presents itself more insecure, um, you'll get some hack attempts. <coughs> so let's start immediately into how does the internet actually work, right? So when you actually fetch a page on the internet from your browser, you're sending an HTTP GET request in general. Um, so there's two types, there's GET and POST requests, there's, there's multiple other types, I mean there's like trace and put and delete and such. But for the most part, we normally refer to GET and POST requests. So the point of a GET request is that the intention of this request is that the state is not changed, meaning that this should not change any behavior of the application, it should not change any settings within the application, it should purely be a GET, as in I'm fetching some kind of information from you and I'm not trying to change anything on the system. So if you reload the page, nothing should change. And if you have any parameters, which would be in the URL bar at the top, they will be visible. So you'll see them directly in the browser. If anybody's shoulder surfing, they'll see any secrets that you have in there. It'll be logged in the browser history. So if somebody gains access to your PC and just looks through the history, they can see whatever secrets were in there. So if you're logging into a website and you see username equals blah, password equals blah directly in the address bar, that's probably a problem, right? So you should not log in um, or just use a really crap password or something from online that you've you know, borrowed that's shared and nobody cares. Um, these things will be logged in a proxy, right? So if you've worked at large organizations, often banks and things, they will include an internal proxy server and you have to use that to get to the internet. And usually the way that works is you have to install certificates on your, uh, your actual laptop in your browser such that whenever you visit a site, first you're actually connecting to this proxy server run by the organization and then that server will relay your request further. This means that that proxy server can see everything you're doing. And this is, of course, intentional because companies want to monitor their employees' usage. They want to be able to block traffic to certain sites that they don't approve of. They want to make sure you're not leaking information, <coughs> things like that. Um, but ultimately, this is a really common way of people losing, uh, you know, losing track of their data, losing some of their sensitive, secure passwords and things like that just because it's getting logged. Now, some companies will do that for everything. So anything you access on the internet, they can see, whether it's your email or whatever. Other, si other companies might actually restrict certain things because they value your privacy to some extent. So they might say, well, Gmail is fine, but then if you use some other wrapper for Gmail or some other online mail provider, they might be intercepting that, right? So depending on how secure you are and how secure you're trying to be, you might be able to catch this. There's ways for browsers to have, for example, certificate pinning, so they'll recognize if, hey, at home I got this certificate from the website, and then when I'm at work, I get a completely different certificate. And then based on that, some browsers or tools will flag that something's going on on your connection. This could happen at McDonald's or anywhere, anywhere else as well, as well. So it's actually really good to, be, uh, to recognize that this can happen and to watch out for it, right? So don't just trust that padlock icon, because that just means your connection is secure between you and whoever it is you're communicating with you should check what that padlock says, what's actually in that certificate. Is it who you expect to communicate with or is it somebody generic like your company's base uh, certificate authority or something like that? Um, additionally, whatever you have in the URL bar, whatever sensitive parameters you have there, they will be passed along in a referrer header. So for example, if I'm on a page, if I'm on Google, for example, and I click one of the search results, when I visit the other page, whatever request I send to that other page, it'll say, I'm coming from Google and with whatever search term I had as well. And that's how you get all these sites that basically just um, have fake content 
where anything you search for, they say, yes, I have a result for that. You click on the link, go to the site, and it just quotes exactly what you typed into Google in your search term and just says, yes, here's the results and just gives you more Google, Google results, right? Because they're just trying to bait you into clicking on their links and maybe they have ads there and stuff like that. So they're basically just abusing the whole referrer header system, I guess, um, but it works and nobody really cares that much because this is some, some features in the internet require this to work. Um, but ultimately then at the bottom in the box there, you see that's an example of a get request. So what it'll ha what'll happen is actually your browser will send uh, over HTTP, it'll send a request the text get, it's looking for a slash search, so that's the page or endpoint or whatever is exposed with parameters HL equals NL, I guess that's the language, and Q equals Secura, in this case we're searching for the word Secura online. Um, additionally, the next header uh, in this request will say host, so google.com. This is important if you have virtual hosting, for example, if you have a shared provider where you have multiple websites being hosted from the same physical machine. Um, simply, it's always at the same IP address, but based on whatever this host address says, whatever this host line says, that's the site it'll serve for you. And finally, there's potentially cookies that are sent along. And the interesting thing about cookies is this happens automatically. So cookies are protected by your browser so that one website cannot read or access or, or write to another website's cookies, right? So they're very restricted. However, they are automatically submitted. So if you're logged in at google.com, you know, for your mail or whatever, and then you go to another Google site that also receives this cookie, then it'll automatically recognize that that's you. If you open a new browser session where you're not logged in, it won't, even if you have both open or if you do um, private browsing mode or incognito or something like that, then it won't default sending these cookies along. But in general, it does. And the point of that is so that you can open multiple tabs in the same application and still have your, you know, the same user and still access the same features and everything you expect. So then the next type of request is a post request. And the intention of these is that the state might be changed meaning that you're trying to do something to actually change the website, whether you're updating your profile or your email address or making a post on a forum. That's what used to happen often where um, people would post to a forum and then immediately hit a five to see if anybody's reading their post or replied already. And then that would of course send another post, the same one. Then you'd get two or three in a row if you were really impatient and just kept smashing F5. And then people would complain because nobody likes double posts and all that. So. This was quite common back then. The, the typical uh, solution to that was to make it redirect, right? So as soon as you've posted your message, you get a little page saying, hey, thanks for posting a message. We'll redirect you to the thread now. It redirects, and from that point on, you can hit a five all you want because it's done one post to show you thanks for posting, and then it's converted it to a get request for the next page. So no longer changing any intent, the, the intent is no longer to change anything, changing any states, just to go to the visit the page. So. In a post, the parameters are in the HTTP body, so the nice thing about that is that they're not visible in logs and they're not cached. Um, so here you can see that there's a post request going to slash user slash update slash five, presumably I'm user number five. It's on the host www.cloudapp.local and there's again a cookie being sent. Potentially this was automatic from a previous session when I was logged in, potentially you get a session the moment you visit the site because they want to track anonymous users as well. Regardless, often you will have a session that'll be in the cookie and that'll get sent along automatically. And then at the bottom, you can see that we've sent uh, various variables to the backend, email equals user at secura.com, my role is number 24, whatever that means, and my name is Jan Janssen. So the problem with the way cookies are sent automatically is it leads to a vulnerability called cross-site request forgery. And this is one of the most common ones. You might have seen something recently in the news, I think two or three weeks ago, um, actually Facebook was vulnerable to exactly this. Um, the problem was in Facebook, you know, you can search for uh, how many of my friends have been to France in the past six months, something like that. Apparently the endpoint that was doing that was not uh, checking any kind of uh, referrer headers or doing any kind of checking to make sure that you belonged, you actually came from Facebook in the first place. So if you were logged in in one tab on Facebook and then on another tab you visited this other site that was doing the malicious action, it could then send a request to Facebook for that uh, API, for that uh, search query and get the results back. So basically what happens is in this example, let's say that we have bank.com and on this bank.com website, there's a pay endpoint and it takes the parameter amount equals 150 and destination account equals 11111. Potentially that's some IBAN, right? Now, as we said before, um, get request should not change the state. In this case, sending money is changing the state. So this is already a bad move. 
but this still happens a lot, uh, just for convenience, just because people don't like having to re-architect things to use post requests instead of get. Um, ultimately, if this is the endpoint, then what can happen is, let's say I have my blog on Securo.com, I make an image link on my blog that goes exactly to that URL. It goes to bank.com slash pay. In this case, I'm setting the amount to 1,000 euro, and I put in my own account. The result of this is, if a user actually visits my page, my blog, and they're already logged in on the bank, then this image tag is going to be loaded within the browser of the user, of course. The user's browser is going to see that this image tag says, hey, there's a picture on bank.com with this URL, pay amount equals destination account equals etc. And of course, the browser has no idea what's at the end of this endpoint, what's, what's actually on the opposite end of this uh, request. So it just says, hey, give me the image at this URL. Since it's on bank.com and I'm already logged in on bank.com, it's going to automatically attach my cookie, my session cookie, right? As a result, what happens on the server side, on the bank.com server, is it sees this request come in. It doesn't care that the user is looking for an image. It has no idea that the user is looking for an image. All it knows is that the user said, hey, give me whatever's at this URL. What happens to be at that URL is I'm going to send money to whoever you told me to send money to. And so if you were logged in and visited my blog, the request would be sent by you in your valid session to send a thousand euro to whatever account I put in, right? So the problem here is, it, same thing with Facebook, just by being logged in in one tab and then visiting a site on another that exploits this vulnerability, this cross-site request forgery vulnerability, um, it'll trigger an action within the website. And that action can send money or can retrieve search results or can do whatever else the web application has been configured to do for a GET request. So the problem, the, how we abuse CSRF is we know what it looks like. So in that original URL, bank.com slash pay with an amount and a destination account, that's always the same. As a user, you could bookmark that. And for you, that could be a convenient way of automatically making a payment every month. You could just have your favorites, click on your favorite, and then there's your rent gone you know, for this month. That you can do standing orders as well, but if you don't trust any of that and you just bookmarked it, that's a pretty easy way to do things. It's convenient for some users, but of course, it's very exploitable. So in order to prevent exploiting this, we add some kind of random token. In this case, we have a CSRF token that we added at the bottom with some kind of random value. As long as this value is actually truly random, so you can't predict it, you can't just guess what it is, and there's no obvious way to figure out what the next one is, um, then this is a secure way of, of protecting this one page. The idea being that when you first log in to the bank, it'll automatically generate this token for you, and it'll add it to every URL. And from that point on, whenever you click on one of the links on the site, it will check, hey, did you include the CSRF token and is it the correct value that we stored? Now, that token is very similar to a session ID, which is also a random value that's somewhere stored in a cookie. Um, and I'd, ideally, you don't want to use the bo one for the other, you know, like don't mix the purposes of these because that's just overloading. You know, you have one thing that you're using for two different purposes, even though a uh, session token and a CSRF token might be identical. You might generate them identically. I mean, they the contents won't be identical, but the format and the method by which it's created will be the same um, or can be the same. Um, you don't want to mix the purpose of them, right? Because one of them, a CSRF token, might be static for your entire session. You might want it to change per action if you really want like an ultimate security site. The problem with that approach, though, would be that it breaks tabs. So as soon as you up, up open more than one link in different tabs, each one will have a different list of tokens, and whichever is the newest one is what the server is going to store. And so then if you click on one of the older links that has the old CSRF token, it's going to break. So multi-tab behavior breaks if you're too aggressive with CSRF tokens. But if they're pretty uh, consistent, if they're pretty static for a session, or they last like five or ten minutes, and you have maybe two that you roll, so you have one that's like ten minutes, and then five minutes in you get the next one, and then either is valid, for every five minute window. Um, in that way you can keep them rotating so that at most, if one of them leaks if somebody obtains this token. The most they have is maybe five or 10 minutes to abuse it before it's no longer valid, right? Similar to sessions as well, you can have rolling sessions. So once we've added this random token, um, we basically prevented cross-site request forgery because I can no longer, yeah? Uh, another risk for uh, randomizing a token for every request, if you load a page which uh, loads multiple sub-components, uh, you don't know in which order they will be requested. So yes. <coughs> it can break there as well. 
Yes, indeed. So depending on how large the content and how many different components there are, the order that they load, uh, yeah, tokens can break. So if in that case, it's good to have an approach of not exactly rolling per action, but maybe five minute windows or something like this. It really depends on your expected usage of the app. Do you expect people to have a page loading with multiple components that might have different tokens? Do you expect users to use multiple tabs and things like that? So it's always a trade off between, you know, security is, is both a problem and a solution, um, but it can be too difficult to be secure and then people will find shortcuts and things like this. So it's always a trade off. So ultimately, one of the main things, uh, the recurring theme in uh, security investigations and such is, can you trust your input, right? So where does input come from? What does it do and can you trust it? Well, ultimately, no, never trust user input. And ultimately, tr uh, trust isn't absolute. It's not a binary yes or no question, right? It's, it's a very gray area. Ultimately, you should never trust, ultimately, you should never trust anything absolutely. Um, you can take the approach of trusting nothing, trust no one, right, like uh, X-Files. Um, so basically, there's data in the database, there's data in files on the system, and to some extent, you will have to trust these because you want your application to work. You should trust your administrator, you should probably trust your colleagues, you should probably trust other people on your network. On the other hand, if it's a big network, if you have uh, exposed endpoints or if you have network ports open and somebody can just wander in and plug something in, then who knows what's gonna happen, right? If your work network has been compromised, then maybe there's junk in your database or maybe there's junk in the files. If there's a rogue administrator, maybe they're messing with these things just to cause problems for the company or the application. Um, if there's a vulnerable application in a shared environment, this is also pretty common. You might have 15 different clients using the same database. They'll have some kind of separation based on user permissions and things like this. But if that's misconfigured or if there's a bug somewhere, then potentially one client can overwrite the content in another client's uh, database, right? And then that can cause problems. So you have to decide how much trust you need, how, like what's the security level of your application? What is the risk? If something goes wrong, are you going to lose millions of dollars or is nobody going to care because it's just your hobby website, right? You need to decide what's the level of risk and then how much security do you need to implement there? And you should also trust the operating system. but you don't know if you 100% can, right? There's like DNS spoofing vulnerabilities. There was recently a study about um, like five out of 17 of the biggest certificate authorities, the people you get your SSL certificates from, uh, a bunch of them were vulnerable uh, to uh, DNS cache poisoning, where basically, uh, I'm not 100% sure how the exploit worked, but it seems like um, ultimately you could say, yes, I own this domain, so give me a certificate for it. But if you happen to masquerade as a DNS server and then their uh, servers would try to query whatever domain you're trying to get a certificate for. If they went to your compromised DNS server, you could feed whatever information you wanted and you could say, yes, indeed, this guy is the owner of this domain. They would trust that and then they would give you a certificate for it. And yes? As far as you know, do you know if there's a alternative to just trusting a bunch of companies to hand out SSL certificates or TLS certificates? Uh, no, indeed, it's it's the public chain of trust. Um, that's <laughs> that's it, un unfortunately no. Uh, if you do not trust the root authorities, then there's not much there. Maybe at some point we'll have some kind of peer-to-peer -peer authentication like that, and then you can trust your friends, and they can trust their friends and such. Ultimately, right now, no. You have to trust some of the root authorities to be able to use anything. Um, so yeah, so you should trust the operating system, but again, nothing is absolute and the OS could have been compromised. So where does user input actually end up going, right? It'll go to some kind of subsystem or some separate system or component, like a SQL database or an email, right? You fill in some details and then an email gets generated either to send to you as a confirmation or to one of your friends to invite them to use the service as well or to the help desk or wherever. XML requests, XPath queries, LDAP, you know, for authenticating with your um, uh, domain. Potentially, there's commands that are being run based on user input directly on the host. Eval statements, right, in JavaScript, things like this, which you shouldn't do, but potentially. External libraries, URLs, the browser, proxy server, logging human user, plenty of places where user input is going to go, right? So part of, the, part of the difficulty of understanding whether a solution is secure is understanding where everything actually is going to go in the end. And so you might um, be testing a very specific use case, like this application as this user because we have no bigger scope, right? As a pen tester, that's usually the problem. You have a very limited scope and it's, this is all you can test. There's this one endpoint, test it and do your best. But the problem is, whatever you do to that endpoint might be getting logged. 
and then that might be getting forwarded to another log server, and then that might be getting picked up by some application somebody wrote to view those logs. And that application might be vulnerable to something like cross-site scripting. So based on whatever I put in my original request, who knows when and how much time has passed, but at some point that might trigger and actually attack somebody. So mapping this whole thing out is very difficult. And that's one of the challenges of actually, first of all, figuring out what's the security of an organization, as well as scoping a specific assignment to test the security of some component, because you don't know how these things interact, how they intertwine. So command injection in general, the um, vulnerability of command injection requires two things. So first it requires a system which processes commands and user input, so some kind of data, which in this case will contain user input, and there must be a way to smuggle commands within the user input. So whatever the command processor at the end that's receiving this instruction stream is, it has no idea which part was originally the command defined by the administrator or the developer of the application or whatever, and which part was the user input. So examples of such systems are the browser itself, in the HTTP response from a server, it's a bunch of commands and data that the browser then parse processes and actually executes, right? Databases are the same. You have a SQL statement, select star from wherever, and some data, where name equals blah. Uh, mail servers, web servers, tons of places like this. So command injection in general is a big thing, and this is cross-site scripting, SQL injection, various other attacks like that. So the main idea of the injection attack is you have an application which sends this string to the command processor. So there's a command, a command with some data, and another command. But that data is actually controlled by a user. Maybe they can put in a date to search for a birthday, or maybe they can put in whatever they want that's not just a date. In that case, if a user put in data followed by two commands in their data stream, then what the command processor is actually gonna see at the end is a command, command followed by data, more commands and then the original command that was followed up in uh, by the application by the developer so what's happened here is you have just entered whatever commands you want and the processor is going to execute them thinking that they're coming from the developer or the application itself so from a trusted or authoritative source and so then the problem with that is you can do whatever you want in a database you guys pr have probably seen sql injection a recent example of sql injection actually was if you're familiar with steam uh, the pc game marketplace so there was actually a bug in their developer uh, interface where developers who have games published on steam they can request free cd keys for people who have bought into the beta or whatever one of the developers was doing some security testing and actually found that you could just, through SQL injection, request as many keys as you wanted. So you could just request millions of keys using their SQL injection vulnerability and then just ship them off to whoever you wanted for free. And thankfully he reported it. Potentially he abused it first and, and you know, made some money or something, but maybe not. I'm sure Valve gave him a nice bounty, but uh, who knows. So the next command processor is a browser. So when you receive a response from a website, it's going to have a heading like HTTP 11302 found, in this case, meaning there's a redirect. Um, you've looked for some kind of resource. It's not where you wanted it. It's not where you were looking, but here's where it is actually, so go here instead. And so then the next line here is a command, the location command, and it's saying the following data, which is a URL, visit this URL next. There's some additional information like how long is the response. In this case, it's pretty big because maybe there's a pretty page. Maybe there's some JavaScript to also redirect users in case this location header doesn't work. Then there's a content type which says, here's what I'm sending you. I'm sending you HTML, so you should render it as HTML. Now there's ways that you can mess with that if the server doesn't specify this. Um, depending on what you're using, it might interpret whatever it wants. As an example, old Internet Explorer, when you went to a page, the, page, uh, the web server could say, here is a picture, right? I'm sending you an image slash JPEG. And then actually the content of the JPEG was HTML because somebody was clever and they instead uploaded HTML instead of a picture. And then the actual application developers didn't validate that. They just assumed it's a picture. So now you've got HTML in a .jpg file on the server. So it comes to the user. And if you were using old Internet Explorer, Internet Explorer would look at it and say, well, the server is telling me that this is a picture. But when I look at it, it's HTML. So I don't care what you guys say. I'm going to render it as HTML. And the same thing would happen with PDFs, which of course could contain vulnerabilities, or whatever other kind of content that you could masquerade as, right? So the problem was Internet Explorer was being very user-friendly in case people screwed up and administrators screwed up so that the website would still uh, behave the way that Microsoft thought it should. Um, but this introduced vulnerabilities. 
and ultimately, if you look at the internet in general, it's just a patchwork of band-aids on top of band-aids. So there's all kinds of bugs everywhere. This was a problem. Of course, then Microsoft introduced an extra header that said, hey, Internet Explorer, don't do that. So you actually had to configure your website to tell Internet Explorer not to be dumb and do random things for you. Um, additional information that it'll give you is, for example, this expires minus one header. So if the content is supposed to be sensitive, and should not be stored in the cache on the browser or on whatever intermediary resources like uh, proxy, proxy servers or other whatever, whatever else is in between you and the server. Um, this would, as well as cache control headers and pragma, no cache headers, those would say, hey, don't keep copies of this because this is sensitive and shouldn't be retained. But often this doesn't happen. People don't actually store this, don't, don't send this back in the content. And so you end up with really sensitive stuff being stored. And you might even log out and somebody sits at your computer and hits back and they can see the contents, which might have been your bank statement or something. Nowadays, banks are a bit better the, uh, about this, but it still happens in various places. There's additional information. So some of the headers aren't actually commands for the user, like the server Apache 2.2.27. That's just nice information to have for a hacker, because I can immediately Google this version of Apache, which is quite old. And there's probably tons of vulnerabilities on the internet available for this version. And then I can immediately just pull a few exploits. There's probably automated tools that'll just exploit it for me. There's plenty of uh, script kitties out that just have tools that actually just scan the web for exactly this version, because they know they can compromise it. And they just automatically go through site by site trying to compromise these things. There's also the date, which might be useful depending on what you're using it for. If you're generating sessions that are just a timestamp, then knowing what time it is on your server can also help me pr predict the next few session IDs and things like that. So if we're just looking at not the content, but the actual headers that are returning from the server, um, we can inject into those potentially. So what will often happen is, let's say you visit your bank and you're trying to go directly to your address book or maybe like your favorite contacts or something like this. If you're not logged in, probably the website will just redirect you to the login page and say, hey, first you need to log in. Often then you'll see in the address bar, you'll see a return URL parameter that equals you know, page slash address book. So that after you've logged in, the website knows, hey, I have this return URL parameter, redirect the guy there because that's what the person wanted in the first place. They wanted their address book. So redirect them there for convenience so that they're automatically where they wanted to be. The problem is if I can change that return URL variable and just send this link of pay, uh, website slash login question mark return URL equals whatever I want. If I can send that to people, I can abuse this property. I can attack their browser, the command processor browser with whatever I put in. So if I'm able to inject www.evil.com and maybe they're actually just adding that to the end of their domain, like secure.com, then this isn't gonna work. It's gonna redirect me to a page that's actually www.evil.com hosted on secure.com, and probably I'll get a 404 saying, hey, this page doesn't exist, you're an idiot. On the other hand, if I can put in a new line, the main difference between headers in what you're sending to the client, uh, to the server, as well as what the server sends back, is a new line. So. If immediately after secure.com, I'm able to inject slash r slash n and add extra headers like cache control or whatever I want, potentially I can do malicious things to the user, like just by setting the header. If it wasn't a location header that I was injecting into, but something else, I could write my own location header and then force the user to be redirected somewhere else. And then I could control that. So they would click a link, which looks like it's actually going to bank.com. They would type in their credentials to log into bank.com. And then they get redirected to some other website, like a competing bank or like porn or something, just if you want to do fraud or reputation damage, right? But the main thing is two new lines. So slash r slash n slash r slash n, two of those is what differentiates the header block from the actual content, the HTML content that's being rendered by the browser in the page. So if I can inject into any header and just put two enters, I can start writing any HTML I want, and that's what the browser is gonna render. Now, the, 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 the user's browser is gonna receive some kind of headers, the content that I wrote, and then whatever the remaining original headers were, because they'll come after the HTML content, because I injected in between, right? But then the browser is just going to see that as bad HTML coming at the end of the request. And so it's not going to care about it. Maybe it'll render it as text or maybe it'll just ignore it depending on how, you, how the page is rendered. And then the interesting thing about this is depending on what infrastructure you have, like for example, a proxy server that you're sharing with your entire organization, if this was a crafted request and also the server can cache the response, then what might happen is now anytime anybody else tries to visit this page, which might have been the secure.com login page, they might get the cached version that I created. 
So now I'm not just attacking whichever user clicked on my link, but I'm attacking any other user who uses the same infrastructure as that first vulnerable user. So I'm using him as a jump gate or a jump stone or whatever stepping stone to attack a whole bunch of other people. And then this content can be anything and it could even look like the proper login page and then just harvest credentials or something like that. And most users won't even realize because you don't see this. You're communicating with your internal proxy. You have no idea what it's doing on the back end, if it's even securely connecting to whatever target you want. And then just something will happen. You'll get some content back and you have no idea if that's correct or not. And that's a really good way of attacking users as well. So as I mentioned with SQL injection, that's a command processor. So let's say the example is we have select top 10 star from users where birthday equals today, because that's the default, but maybe the user can put in their own birthday, then we have an injection attack, right? And you can just customize, write whatever code you want in that injection point. So as an example, if we have a login form and then after logging in, it says select star from users where name equals admin and password equals password. Well, then this is fine. If we just typed in the word admin and maybe password as the password, this is what the SQL statement is going to be, the first one. On the other hand, if I follow up with an apostrophe, admin apostrophe, the apostrophe is a special character in SQL. It's what designates the, the string values from regular commands. And so what's actually going to happen in this case is there will be an error because now originally in, in my original statement, I already had a quote because I was using the user variable in between quotes in the statement. But now the user presented another quote, and so now there's a double quote, and the SQL database will say, hey, you have two quotes in a row, there's an unterminated string, that's a problem, please fix it. And so nothing happens, which is fine, but maybe the user gets a nice uh, message back saying, hey, you have an error in your SQL syntax at line whatever, right? So then if we change that to be admin apostrophe or one equals one, then the resulting SQL statement, uh, as you can see, yeah, as you can see there, um, basically what we're doing is we're checking, so select star from users where the name equals admin. So if there is a user named admin, it will select that, or one equals one, which is always true. So this, uh, this query will actually return every single row in the database. Depending on how you've actually coded this, um, if your login form is expecting just one return value, then maybe you're going to just throw an error or something because you're getting like 100 records back. Alternatively, it might just pick the first record and you're logged in as that because the dash dash at the end of the statement is the comment in SQL. And so everything after that, which originally was and password equals whatever, that's commented out and ignored. So now we've completely gotten rid of the password check and we're just saying, hey, give me the first user, uh, give me the username admin or whatever users are in the database and that's me. The problem here is you can also configure your database to not allow comments, which is a really good thing to do in production because you should not be sending statements with comments to a database in production, most likely. So the next alternative is we can do admin apostrophe or the string A equals open string B, right? And then I'm using the closing string that the developer originally intended to be added here. Um, and then the resulting SQL statement, what it actually says is, give me all users where the name equals admin or and then the remainder will evaluate to false because A is never going to equal B. So the entire right side is going to be false because the or statement. So the and gets, is gotten rid of as well because that gets lumped with the or, which is false. So we ignore that. Just give me admin and that's who I'm logged in as. If there is an admin user, that's who you are now. If you have the name of another user, then you can just put their name in there. Potentially, you could also inject into here and say, well, actually give me where the name equals admin or their ID is one or their ID is greater than 100 or greater than 1,000. If you know something about the internals of the database or maybe the user IDs and things like that, you can really specifically target various users like this. So next up is um, reflected cross-site scripting. Um, the, the point of reflected cross-site scripting is what happens when if you visit a site and you put in some kind of data and that response page pastes that directly back to you. The problem with this is what's coming back to the user is again just a se sequence of commands, a, a string of instructions that the browser is going to interpret. And if I'm able to put my own code in there, then the browser is not going to have any idea that this isn't coming from the developer, that it's actually coming from the original user. And compared to that, there's stored cross-site scripting where I might maybe make a post on a forum or something and embed some kind of script tag, some kind of HTML or JavaScript or whatever. And then that gets stored there. 
and then any other user who visits that page will also be affected. So the difference is in reflected cross-site scripting, you would have to do like a phishing attack. You would have to email somebody or somehow send them a link that they have to click on and then it targets them specifically. Whereas with a stored cross-site scripting attack, it's stored on the server and then any user who visits the compromised page will be attacked. Now, the main thing here is this is just unvalidated, unsanitized input. If you're letting users put whatever they want into the application, you're trusting it and then you're just returning it directly without actually inspecting it or validating it or checking that it fits some kind of format or whatever, that's gonna open you up to vulnerabilities. So the point of cross scripting is, if an attacker can execute JavaScript in your browser, what can they actually do? Well, they can uh, change form input elements, they could affect the content of the page, they can rewrite the content of the page, they can rewrite the content like um, where the form is actually gonna submit data. So if you have a login form with cross-site scripting vulnerabilities on the same page, you could just say, when they click login, instead of going to bank.com slash login, actually go to evil.com slash login, I'll record the credentials and then maybe redirect you back to bank.com and login for you. It could access session cookies and then compromise a session. So you could leak it to a server or something and then somebody else elsewhere could just take that cookie value, put it for their own cookie, access the website. And the website, if it only checks that session cookie, it'll just accept that this is the same user, even though now suddenly they're in Russia or in China or something. It's fine, it's the same session, therefore it's the same person and we don't care, we don't check anything. Potentially JavaScript could also request other URLs. So if you're internal at a network and there is no, you know, there's, uh, the internal network is not exposed publicly, it's just within a bank or whatever, potentially I could write JavaScript that's just gonna try scanning internal websites and see what's there and maybe take some of that content and then just post it back out to my own website. So I could scrape the contents of your internal knowledge base or something like that and just leak that wherever I want. And if you have sensitive information internally about how your organization operates, or if you're developers and you have really good internal knowledge base resources, something like that, um, and you don't want that to leak because that's part of your competitive advantage, you know, you train your internal developers with really nice custom training, um, that could get leaked. And then that's really gonna damage your organization, your competitive advantage. And then you can attack, uh, launch cross-site request forgery um, attacks even on protected requests. Because if you have cross-site scripting, you can just read that token, the secret token, and then just use it included in the request. So the whole point of how to defeat these, um, you have to escape content, and this depends on where it's gonna be used. So for example, in the database where the single quote was important, you have to escape that single quote. And often that means either just removing it or putting a backslash before it so that it's securely stored as just the backslash character, or sorry, as the single quote character without actually affecting the way the command is processed in the database. And in XSS, in, in uh, cross-site scripting, let's say as an example, I'm able to change my email address in my profile on a website. And originally it was hans at example.com, and now I'm adding a script alert one tag to that. So I'm adding some kind of JavaScript or HTML to the end of it. The problem is if any other user views my profile, maybe that'll execute if it's not properly sanitized and now you get a worm or something like back in MySpace, the Sammy worm or something like that, where anytime anybody actually looks at it, it automatically propagates to everybody else in that user's address book and it just keeps going through and through all over the website. So the point is you need to actually escape the input and in this case, we're using HTML entity encoding. So the angle bracket, the opening angle bracket is and LT semicolon, which is less than, the next one is greater than, um, and ampersand becomes and amp, things like that. By doing it this way, in the website, when the user actually visits the site, it'll look like the character they intended, maybe an angle bracket because maybe in the future our names will contain angle brackets, right? You never know. Um, so maybe you want angle brackets to be acceptable input, but you don't want it to be rendered as HTML, in which case you replace it with something that looks the same, but doesn't actually work the same for the command processor. So scripts and user input, I mean, user input can get everywhere. But then what can actually execute? What, can, what scripts can run? Well, HTML content that contains user input, that can contain scripts that run. Same with JavaScript. Maybe you have a JavaScript endpoint that's serving just JavaScript, but based on some parameter, like if it's for Internet Explorer or Firefox or something, it'll give some kind of different output. Maybe I can put in my own code in there based on that. CSS style sheets used to have the expression tag where you could just put in any kind of JavaScript as well. HTTP response headers, as I said, you just put two enters and now you're writing HTML. So again, you can just script anything. 
downloaded files, ActiveX, Java applets, Ajax responses, all of these can result in execution of code. And if you allow users to put code in there, you'll probably get exploited for it. So you have to escape things appropriately for where they're actually going to be used. Yeah. So I have a few examples here. So the first one is if user input is going to end up somewhere like in a box on the page because it's their email address and they want to see that it's correct, you need to encode it in the correct way. In this case, it's HTML entity encoding where you have the ampersand quote, ampersand less than, greater than. On the other hand, if it's for like a link, the contents of a link is going to um, contain something that the user supplied that needs to be encoded in a different way because it's going to come up in the URL. It needs to actually be um, recognized by the browser as part of the URL. And for that, we use URL encoding, which is percentage 20, percent 3, percent 3C. On the other hand, if you have maybe like an alert box, the user's logged in and you want to pop up saying, hey, welcome to the site, their name, and their name can contain quotes and angle brackets and things like that. Well, then you need a different encoding method. In this case, it's hex encoding where you're basically just escaping with a backslash X and then the hex code of whatever character it is that you want to display. And finally, if you're actually trying to do eval of user input in a safe way, you can't. So no matter how you encode it to look right, that's going to make it execute correctly when put through an eval statement. So don't do this, please. So there's a quick checklist. Um, basically, there's try to use reusable functions throughout your code. So as a developer, this is the main thing that you can do to be as specific as possible for the purpose of user input. So don't just have um, request.getParameter whatever, because in Java especially, request.getParameter can come from a cookie, can come from a post variable, can come from a get request, like a query variable. So try to be as specific as possible regarding where the variable is coming from and what is its intended use. So get post param int, meaning it'll automatically cast the variable, which comes in as a string, of course, to an integer. And then you know that from that point on, if this is the only way you can get user input, you know it's already in the format you're expecting. You can do additional validation routines. And as long as you're doing this consistently, you're doing immediate checks on the range and doing regular expressions, then great. That's going to be the safest way to do things. If you have more complex validation, so for example, a date, you can't really do that easily through a regular expression. So you're going to leave that till the end. So you're going to do some simple regular expression checking at the start just to make sure that the date is, you know, uh, month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. Um, and that's nice for regular expression to do quickly, but it's not going to be able to easily validate is this a correct day on a leap year um, on some month or even February, actually 28th is exactly. So basically the really specific checks you want to do later and you want to do simple checks early on because the problem might be for example, the date parser might be vulnerable to certain characters like null bytes or other weird things. And so by using first a simple regular expression to get rid of all the um, illegal or invalid characters, you then know that you're only giving valid data in maybe an invalid format, but you're giving valid data to the actual validator, the date object, and then hopefully it won't be exploited itself. And this is also where you can do access control and authorization checks. But again, be careful about null bytes because in different languages they mean different things like Yes? Uh, you say uh, strip uh, the null bytes. Uh, what do you recommend uh, when you find invalid input? Do you recommend uh, dropping the entire request because there's obviously, obviously something wrong or just go ahead, best effort, and let's see where things crash? So, so it'll really depend on the usage and what you expect and how user-friendly you want to be. Ultimately, the safest is if it doesn't comply with the requirements, drop it. Right? So don't try to fix it. Don't try to be like, well, you have this extra character. I'll get rid of it for you. Don't do any of that. Just say no. Give a message to the user saying, hey, this isn't allowed. Ideally, the front end also does validation. Right? So in JavaScript, you can check what the user is actually putting in. And then the front end can actually say, hey, look, you didn't put in the correct format of data. So please fix it. And then if the back end still gets invalid data, you know that they're bypassing the front end checks. They're probably that guy. And then you just drop it. So that's the, that's the safest. Don't try to massage things to fix them. Um, as far as null bytes go, it depends on where it's going, depends on how you're using it. If it's a very specific case, you might just filter it out. That might be an acceptable means, but that could lead to other vulnerabilities. So I've done an investigation before where what actually happened is um, when communicating with one application, my request would end up getting proxied to another legacy application in the back end. And unfortunately, that legacy application did not accept variables in the conventional way, as in the get or post request. So what they did is they converted all the variables that I sent to the front end into headers, and then they sent those headers to the back end, back end processed it, and actually sent all of those headers back to me. 
meaning that if I created a variable called location and sent it to the server, it would send this location header to the back end and that would send it back to me. And now I would have a redirect or I could put in whatever headers I wanted and attack users accessing it in this way. And what I did is I tried, tried putting in that exact one, like set cookie or location or something like this, and they flagged it, they dropped the request because they said, hey, actually, this is a keyword that we're not allowing you to use for because we know that it's sensitive. However, then I put in a slash n in the middle of the word location or between set cookie. And so what they had is instead of first removing characters and then checking against the whitelist, first they were checking against actually the blacklist. So they saw this isn't set location because it's set enter location. Next, they had a routine that removed the enter. So now it recreated my set location or uh, sorry, set cookie. Um, and then that got passed into the back end. So they actually had security measures in place, but their security measures helped me to bypass their security measures. And you need to be aware of encodings as well. So if you're expecting Chinese characters or if you're expecting whatever language, make sure that that's actually correctly configured. And on the topic of JavaScript, so if you have third party code, so that's coming from like Google, like jQuery or something like that, you should really be careful about how you use it, right? Do you read through it and make sure that it's safe? Does somebody read through it and make sure it's safe before you use it? Ideally, you should check it that it's safe. You should create a copy of it that you store on your server and then you use that copy. But then the problem is that JavaScript might pull in more third party JavaScript. So at some point you have to really dig deep into what uh, functionality, what frameworks you're using to make sure that there is nothing weird happening. There is nothing being pulled in from third party servers. And there's new controls like uh, the integrity tags. Basically, you can add a checksum saying that, hey, when this page loads this JavaScript, it should have this MD5 or SHA1 or whatever checksum. Um, and then if that ever changes on the server, the browser will see, hey, this is different than what it was when, when this page was written. Don't execute it. So that'll break your website, but it's still actually functional. Um, it, it's safer, actually. So. The next issue is that there's uh, request throttling. Right, so if you have some kind of resource like generating report or sending emails or whatever, make sure that these cannot be spammed. Make sure that they can't be hit thousands of times per second or something like that. If it's a login form, clearly one user should not be trying to log in a thousand times. They're probably just trying to guess somebody's password. So you can throttle their, throttle their access by the IP address, which works in some cases, but not all. So for example, if you have an organization that um, shares a proxy, like a bank with one proxy and all their traffic goes out one IP address, if all 1,000 users try to log into Google at the same time at lunch, then potentially Google will see that as an attack because there's a thousand login attempts from one IP address, right? So depending on how the throttling mechanism is configured, this could actually cause denial of service vulnerabilities or things like that. So you really have to balance how strict you want to be with how usable you want to be. Error handling is also quite a problem. Uh, so what we often see is stack traces coming back from uh, web applications, and that'll often have a lot of information regarding what technology they're using, what version of stuff they're using. And based on that, we can start refining attacks against the application because we can Google what, it, what version of uh, Jackson XML parser you're using or whatever like that. So that'll often give a lot of information if it's technical details, but then there's also information that you can get just based on what kind of error you're getting back. So if I'm trying to access a specific contract on a website, but I'm not logged in, I would expect to get an error saying you're not logged in, right? That's the simplest check. If I am logged in, but I don't have access to any contracts at all, then I should have a response saying, hey, you don't have access to any contracts. And finally, if I have access to some contracts, but not one in specific, in this case, number one, two, three, it should say you don't have access to this one or ideally no contract with this ID was found. Because the problem is if I get that first error right from the beginning, then I already know that contract number one, two, three exists and I don't have access to it. And that makes me want to see it, right? So this is kind of a lure. So you try to make sure that just like um, input validation happens from simplest to most specific. Likewise, error handling and, and, and error output should be from the most generic to the most specific. <coughs> so there's some authorization issues as well. Depending on what kind of uh, website you're doing, you want users to be able to only access their own stuff. As an example, let's say that we have an integer cart ID, which is uh, pulled from a get request, which is done in Java, uh, in Java by request.get parameter cart ID. And then we're, constru we're constructing a SQL query that uses that cart ID. The problem here is a user can put in whatever number they want, and then they will receive that respective cart. And if that's somebody else's shopping cart, then they'll see that data. 
So then of course the next thing that you would do is add some kind of check that does this actually belong to the current user that's logged in. And that's fine, but now this code is a bit more complicated and every single time you want to access a shopping cart, you need to make sure that you check that the user is there, check that the user object is valid and make sure that you do this and or even a union between multiple tables for ownership just to make sure that this user owns this cart. And as a developer, you guys can really approach this from the other side and say, I want my code to be secure by default. So if a cart requires a user, so you cannot have a shopping cart without a user, and if you can't request a shopping cart, if you can't request anything from the application without actually being logged in and having such a user, then make sure that in order to get a cart, you do user.getCart, right? And in that case, the user object will handle this check for you. There has to be a user before you can request the cart. And then the user object itself will make sure that the cart belongs to that user. And this way, the, the idea is that just by removing one or two lines, you're not reducing the security of the code. You're only going to make it break or increase the security. So it should never be that just by forgetting something, you've opened up a bug. You need to be very defensive in how you program things. And this is also related to direct references. So if I can pick a country in a dropdown and then the value is NL, um, and then on the back end, it's, creating, uh, uh, it's loading a template off of the server based on my user input, in this case, a get parameter um, country, then potentially there's path traversal. Could I put it, because I could put in dot dot slash, dot dot slash, dot dot slash, dot dot slash, et cetera, slash password. And then it's gonna create this uh, reference to that link that I said, it's gonna go up a few uh, pages, uh, a few folders actually, and if it's a Unix-based system, then it's going to look at the actual the user passwords that are stored on the system and maybe dump that for me. And if I finish it with like a null character to get rid of this .tmpl, then I'll basically just get a page showing me here's all the users, here's all their hashed passwords, and I can start cracking that and get all the password accounts uh, for your actual host. So the way to fix it is to make these into indirect references. So instead of having NL and using that string directly in constructing the query, what you instead have is you have an array on the back end that you've created where item one is NL, item two is Canada, item three is America or whatever. And then the only valid entries in this array are gonna be actual countries that you have. So the only bug here is if I put in minus one or a billion or something and that doesn't exist, then it's gonna go out of bounds on the array and you're gonna get an array out of bounds exception. So compared to the previous example, which would have been potentially leaking credentials and compromising the host, this is now maybe a stack trace, right? So we've gone from a higher critical vulnerability to what's low or maybe even a node. Yes? Uh, sorry? Enum. Oh, enum, yes, indeed, yes, yes. Indeed, you can use an enum, uh, indeed, it's the same idea. Um, depending on how you want to create it and how you want to parse it, if it's maybe a runtime, you might use an error, otherwise, yes, indeed, uh, an enum. Um, so I do have a demo, however, I notice that I'm out of time, so I don't know if I can quickly do a demo or after, yeah, okay, cool. So let's see if we can quickly do this. Um, so I have here a whiskey shop. You can buy whiskey. I'm gonna log in, don't save, okay, don't save. Oh no, demo gods. Sorry, one sec. Okay, so we log in, don't save, and it says an error has occurred. And potentially we have an idea that there's a vulnerability here. I'm not gonna go showing how we look at it on the login page, but let's say that right here we wanna find, we think that there's a vulnerability. There's multiple parameters in the URL. There's this authentication. There's an ID equals one, two, three. And then there's a message equals error authenticating to AD. So I'm running burp. Burp is a local proxy. You can just download it for free. It's a Java based app. You can run it. You should have no problem. There's a free version. It has plenty of features to get you started. And you can use this while developing your own applications to test them as you go. So what it shows you is it actually has in full detail all the communication that your browser is doing. You have to set your browser to go through the proxy first, but after that it's basically in the middle between you and whatever server you're communicating with, and you can see all the data that's getting sent back and forth. So in this case, in the first request to get, I can see my original get request, which has a bunch of stuff added automatically, some of which is proprietary, like a, like, um, uh, update, upgrade and secure request. This is specific to Firefox, so not all browsers use it. I also have a cookie of some sort that's being included, which I'll get into later. 
And then you can look at the response. In this case, it's saying it's not modified because I apparently had a cached version. Um, but after hitting F5, well, it didn't actually load it. Um, but then I have a post request where I actually tried to log in. So you can see that I sent my user equals ASD, password equals ASD. And in my response, I had a 302 found. It redirected me to the error page. And then when I go to the actual error page, you can see that here's the original request. I'm getting XSS slash error with a bunch of parameters. And then in response, I'm getting this error display. So the next thing to do is to actually try testing this. I'm going to right click and I can send it to repeater. And this is basically like hitting F5 in a browser. It's the exact same request. And on the right, I see the response. The benefit of doing it this way is it's much faster. I'm not parsing any of the images that are loaded on the page. I'm not parsing any other JavaScript or um, CSS files or anything like that. I'm purely sending some text and receiving some text back. And then I can examine how the application changes based on my input. But this is a very manual process. I can just put stuff in there, see how it changes in this case. I now have a authentication ASD, ASD. So you want to automate testing. So you're going to instead right click and send it to Intruder. Intruder has this uh, configuration where first it says what target. So make sure you know, that you're not attacking Google or YouTube because that's probably you'll get in trouble. Um, or maybe the company will get in trouble and then they'll trace it to you if they can. Um, but then actually what you want to do is you go to this positions page. So you can see that there's these little tokens that it's injected here. And this is where it thinks that there's some kind of meaningful variable. And it'll try putting stuff in there, just putting attack strings in there to see what happens. In this case, I know that the cookie is irrelevant, so I'm not going to attack it. Um, but you could. There's also various options on how to attack. So do you attack all of these parameters at once or one at a time? These depend on the application and what you're actually trying to achieve. There's payloads. So in the default version, there's nothing. And you would one by one type in stuff here. Um, in, the, in the paid version, there's actually a lot of lists of like cross-site scripting attacks and things like that. I prefer to stick to simple stuff. Maybe just try a few weird um, characters just to see what actually happens. So I've got this list of things that I'm going to inject. Actually, I'm going to remove this one and instead just put single quote, double quote, angle bracket, angle bracket. Now the next thing I'm going to do here is add a payload processing rule. And I'm going to add a prefix of ASD. The idea being that I want to see where my input comes back to me. So by having this automatically add the letters ASD, which should not be on the web page in the first place, right? So this is some kind of unique string for me. You can make up whatever random thing you want. The idea is that if I ever see ASD coming back to me on the response, then I know that something I put in on one side is coming back to me uh, at the end. So this makes it easier to actually tie together what I put in and what's coming back. So then in the options, you've got how many threads you want to use. This depends on how the application works and how, is it multi-threaded? Like, do, will it work if you submit multiple requests as the same user or not? Um, you can throttle that, of course. But then the, the important thing is I'm going to go to this grep extract section. And basically, you put in a regular expression here. I'm going to do ASD dot, 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 dot. So anywhere in the response I see ASD, it's going to pull that out and highlight it for me just to make it much easier for me to find what's actually going on. And then I go start attack. And it pops up a window and does all of the injection attacks for me, one by one. And in this first one, you can see that in position one, in the type variable, it did authentication. And then it added ASD. And then it did my first injection string of 123123. One, and on the right side, I can see what's actually coming back. So I can see, is anything getting sanitized or not? And so in this case, for the first variable, for position one on the left, I can see that every string I put in it's getting somehow modified. Well, the one, two, three isn't because that wasn't that important. Neither is the second one because it had no malicious characters. However, the single quote, double quote, angle bracket, angle bracket, that's what you would use for HTML in most places. And that's getting sanitized here. You can see that the single quote is fine, but the double quote became an at and quote symbol. For the second variable, nothing's coming back. So presumably, it's doing some kind of validation, maybe checking is it an integer. And if it's not, it might be ignoring me. Either way, I don't have any kind of interesting interaction here. With the third one, however, I can see that my, for my injection of ASD, single quote, double quote, angle bracket, angle bracket, it's coming back exactly the same in the response. So potentially, they're not doing any kind of sanitization. So now I can right click and send this one to repeater. And I can just hit go again just to see how it looks. Then I can go ahead and change things here. Specifically, I'll do the classic uh, script, well, script alert, one, two, three, slash script. Now, of course, you might have seen like owned or XSS or something like this. Um, I can look in the response here and I see that actually my script tag is coming back exactly the way it was. This doesn't render anything. So instead, I'm going to right click. I'm going to copy URL. I'm going to go to uh, my browser. I'm going to paste it in. 
Great, I have a pop-up with one, two, three, right? What a hacker. So you might see this in a report and you're like, well, what the hell? Um, well, what can you do with this? So let's do a quick example of that. So if I know that I have such a vulnerability um, that does a pop-up, what I can do next is I can actually write some JavaScript that's going to execute in that pop-up. Instead of the pop-up, it, what it's going to do is, in this case, I'm going to go through the DOM tree, and I'm going to hide all of the components of the page. So I'm actually going to run it. It's going to pop up here. I'm just going to click through quickly so I can open up in a proper window. So I've got this pop-up just to say what's actually happening. So first, it's going to hide the content, and it's done. And now I have a nice blank page from which I can work. Now, of course, there was a pop-up, which is pretty obvious something's happening, um, but you don't have to have that pop-up. But either way, now I just have a blank page. What can I do with that? Well, of course, the next step is now I'm going to try to do um, XML HTTP request. So that's I've got here. Uh, I'm creating an XML HTTP request object, and then I'm fetching the original index page, the login page. When I pop this up in a new window, again, I've got these pop-ups showing what's going on. So first, I'm going to hide the content. Content's hidden. Now I'm going to do the XML HTTP request to fetch the login page, and then I'm going to paste it in. So I'm still on the error page. You can see I'm on error.php still, but it looks like the login page. Great. So now I'm going to go to the next step. I'm going to get rid of those pop-ups just so you, so you can see what actually it looks like um, without being obvious. So you can see that it does that brief flash. Because the, the problem is the original error page had a white background. Then I'm processing and loading the login page, and then I'm changing the background to be black. Right? So if a user is really paying attention, they might notice that something is happening here. It's flashing and something's going on, but they might not realize what's going on. They might not look in the URL bar to see that there's actually all this code here. You could also encode this code, right? encrypt it somehow or obfuscate it somehow so that users can't clearly read it. And then it looks like just some random ID in the URL, which is normal. That's how the internet works. right? There's all kinds of junk in there. So now you have basically a link that you can send to somebody when they get it, they see the login page, they type in whatever they want, their login credentials, and you can submit the query. But the problem is, since I control this, I could have rewritten the page that it's going to submit to, and instead it's actually going to submit the credentials to my website. So now I've harvested your credentials. Again, this is not that exciting, because what if your website has no purpose? What if it's just like your favorite books, a book club or something like this? Who cares if the password to the book club leaks if you're not using it for anything else? That's not the worry thing, worrying thing about cross-site scripting. So I'm going to go to the next step and run it. I'll pop it up in a new window as well so you can see what's going on. You don't see anything. In the URL, there's a script tag that's getting loaded. If I go to the object inspector, I can see that indeed there is a script tag that got embedded on the page. And if I go to the network tab, well, it looks like every second there's a request being sent for some reason, right? As long as this browser is open, there's a request going somewhere. And actually, it's going to my server. And I have the administrative interface, not here. I have the administrative interface right here. This is called the Browser Exploitation Framework. You can just download this. It tells you exactly what script tag to embed where. As long as you host this on a server that is accessible from the internet, you just have this script tag, you just pop it in wherever you see cross-site scripting, and it'll get pulled in. And you can see here on the left, online browsers, I have one that's connected. I can click on it. I can see the details. It's Firefox. Here's the version. There's a Citrix, Citrix receiver plugin, apparently. I have a Java plugin, so it's detected my plugins. I can see logs, like what the user has done in the window if they've clicked or moved the mouse around. I can send commands because this browser is connected to my server right now. It's asking my server constantly, hey, do you want me to do anything? And I can say, sure, tell me what plugins you've got installed. Maybe I can look at your webcam. Maybe I can download stuff for you. Maybe I can send debug commands or there's various exploits that might work on whatever version of whatever operating system or, or uh, browser you're using. And based on these, I can just say, whoever this user is, send this command and execute it in your browser and I can do whatever I want. And as long as the user has that browser window open, maybe I've even minimized it, or like in old days when there was always pop-up ads everywhere and they kept getting hidden and stuff, if I've made this hide somehow, then as long as the user doesn't realize it, I can use their browser to do whatever I want, whatever JavaScript can do, which can be mining cryptocurrency, or attacking a competing bank, or attacking whoever I want, or scanning sites for more vulnerabilities where the user doesn't realize they're now actually actively attacking other sites. 
So the vulnerability here isn't that you need to protect your website from against cross-site scripting attacks. The thing is you're trying to protect your users from having your website used as a tool to use them as a tool to attack other things in entirely, right? So you're protecting the entire internet, not just your website. And that's it for the demo. So that's the first half and break. Thank you very much. Let's stand over here, just to be on the safe side. Um, does anyone have a question? Thank you, thank you very yeah, much for the talk, yeah. by the way. It was great. Any, any questions? Oh, a couple of questions. Oh, one here. Yep. This is close. Uh, for the SQL uh, injection section, uh, I'm surprised you didn't mention prepare statements yes. for that. Yeah, no, and that's one of the things. Unfortunately, there's a lot I, I can't fit everything, and I went over already, so. <laughs> Yeah, but indeed, so prepared statements or sorry, yeah, prepared statements indeed are one of the standard ways and that's just basically abstracting away how you're sending commands to the database. Instead of sending a, a string of mixed commands and data, you're saying first, here's all my commands and then you're saying, and here's the data that those commands should act on. And then this actually in a, in a, a logical way on the database server actually separates the commands from the data, makes it impossible for commands to be smuggled within the data. Unfortunately, no such thing easily exists for cross-site scripting. There is a bit you can do with like content security policy and things like that, but it's not yet as common, so. Um, the demo went over a classical um, multi-page application. Uh, how does this translate to single-page applications where usually the browser has to be in an exact state for anything coming back from the API to have any sort of influence on the browser? Um, okay, well what do you mean, like exactly? Um, the website itself is loaded from a different server than where the API requests are uh, going to and coming back from the API. Yeah. So there are policies, uh, there are headings and stuff. Yeah, indeed. So there are policies, uh, there are headings and stuff you can set to say, well, this resource can be accessed from this other domain. And likewise, you can say, well, on this page, I'm able to fetch content from some other domain. So there are protections for this. They are a bit iffy, so you need to really be sure that you're configuring them correctly, right? You can look at referrer headers and things like that. You can set the content security policy and like uh, access control policy, things like this. There are multiple headers for this. Part of the problem is there's been a lot of competing headers or different approaches to this over the last few years. So trying to figure out which one is the most new and which one is the most supported across all browsers is a bit of a pain. But basically, if you refer to like uh, OWASP or something like that, it'll have all the guidance on what is the most modern way of approaching this. How can you restrict um, w where your endpoints can be accessed from and what kind of data can be returned? Since your uh, focus is most technical, I was wondering how, and you're doing a lot of work in the Netherlands, uh, wondering how you look at the secure software development initiative that's taken a couple of years ago by the CIP of the government. Uh, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not super familiar with it. Um, so, yeah, actually, I, I, don't know, I don't know what the CIP is. Um, most of my uh, experience is on the, the review side of code, so not so much on the secure development side of code. I've done a fair bit with like uh, code review tools like check marks and fortify and things like this, which you should obviously embed into your development lifecycle, have them automatically triggered on build and stuff like that. And that is indeed a, a good way of approaching security. I mean, it's defense in depth, right? And the idea is that as early as you can, you need to catch bugs before they go to production because the later you catch it, the more it's gonna cost to fix. So indeed, I think that the uh, secure development lifecycle is very important and having the tools necessary to actually scan your code and ideally even review designs before you start writing code, uh, that's very important. So, so yeah, embed security in the process from the very beginning. Any more questions? Well, in that case, well, one more time, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks.